Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Gospel Nova Scotia. If you're tuning in over the next few weeks, I'm going to be doing a, a, just a small series on uh, what I'm calling timelines. It's a really simple thing. It's actually three different timelines that God uses through Scripture uh, to show us sort of a picture of a, the season where he's going to be returning uh, to rule and reign here on this earth. So those three timelines are found prophetically in, this, in, in the Bible concerning the state that the world gets in. I'm not going to be dealing with sort of, um, what, what would you call it, almost um, where the Bible starts to describe things like what men become like in that it talks about their attitudes or how, how they become lovers of money and all that because those are absolutely 100% true. Uh, but they're really hard to quantify because someone could always say, well, you know, people were worse uh, 25 years ago than, than they are today, or the world was a, a worse place 100 years ago than it is today. So uh, those are really hard things to kind of say, yeah, this is proof that we are close to the return of Christ. But we don't have to just look at changes in attitude or changes in lifestyles. We can actually look at some concrete things in Scripture, timelines, uh, that show us uh, how close we are to the return of Christ. I had the chance many years ago to uh, teach on the book of Daniel and Revelation. I enjoyed it, and uh, I was teaching it to a group of Indian students, and I can't imagine how hard that was for them when I think back to it. Um, you know, there I was teaching in English to people that hardly knew how to speak it. And, and worst of all, I was teaching uh, out of some of the most, some of the hardest books there are to teach from, Daniel and the book of Revelation. But if, if nobody else <laughs> enjoyed it, I did. I had some fun reading it. Uh, and studying through, I had a ma big maze of study Bibles and commentaries, and I think there was even a book by um, Dr. Youngy Cho, I think there was a book uh, that was helping me to study this as well. And uh, so I had a great time doing it. You know, I don't know if the guys got anything out of it, but I got plenty out of it. At the time when I was doing it, too, it was funny. Some missionaries from Europe were making their way through uh, the part of India that I was in, southern India. And they, they told me, I told them what I was teaching, you know, and uh, they said, you know something? It's pretty popular nowadays to see these prophecies it's in the light of the birth of the european union and at that time i'd never heard that not that it wasn't around i just i wasn't interested in in the study of the end times what they call eschatology because it didn't change anything you know, but whether it changes something or not, it must change something in me because there's a reason for it being in Scripture. It's not just there to fill the pages. It's, it's there to give us an idea of how uh, real this event is and how, and how the build-up to it is uh, something God chose to give us clues and hints about through Scripture. And I'm just going to be following... Uh, sort of a straight line. I'm not going to be trying to decipher uh, one chapter after another. I'm just going to be following a straight line in the book of Daniel concerning the timeline of the world, and that then shifts over into the book of Revelation, and it's the same picture, same timeline. Uh, that unfolds there. Now, the book of Daniel is best known for Daniel in the lion's den. If you're new to the Bible, that's probably still something you've heard about uh, as a kid. What seemed like an act of faith, where Daniel was thrown into um, the lion's den, uh, and he survived through the night, and the king came the next morning and, and was so happy to see that he'd made it through. And we teach that as though it's a matter of, hey, look, Daniel had faith, you know, and he made it through the night. But really, Daniel 
is, I'm going to say, the chief prophet in Scripture. Maybe some people would say Jeremiah is, but I, I really think Daniel is. And uh, that was the satanic attack to try and stop, I believe, what was about to come, which were uh, some of the most incredibly prophetic chapters in the Bible. And that that attack to uh, destroy his life by um, his political, I guess they were political enemies at the time, that just wanted to become closer to the king and to get him out of the way. Uh, well, that attack backfire, but it wasn't just a human attack. It was an attack on the ministry that was about to come in his life. And that ministry was, it was second to none, in my opinion. The The, the last half of the book of Daniel is a, a basic master class in the prophetic. It shifts from prophesying about the near future of the Jews uh, under the control of Babylon. It shifts from that to the prediction of the coming of Christ, the buildup of the different kingdoms up and until the coming of Christ, and then it shifts all over again. It's, it, it, it's, it's just a wild ride, the last half of Daniel. And it shifts from predicting the coming of Christ to uh, the buildup of the return and second coming of Christ. And it uses all sorts of metaphors, different animals and imagery. And then it will shift from doing that to giving you that exact same prophecy from a different point of view. So, it's almost like uh, if you've ever heard when police question uh, people at a um, a four-way stop after there's a car accident, the retelling of what happened seems almost different from each one, but actually they're all telling the exact same story. It's just the point of view has shifted. And that's what happens near the end of Daniel. The point of view is taken from all sorts of different points of view. And then, <laughs> to not, not, not to even say that that wasn't awesome enough, uh, he then goes into the most unbelievable chapter there is in the Bible. In fact, it is responsible for many, many, many people not or choosing not to believe the Bible is real because it predicts in such, and we're not going to get into that. This is not a study of the book of Daniel. I'm just kind of giving you a heads up of what uh, it contains uh, before we get into it. It actually predicts the the remnants uh, after Alexander the Great, the four generals uh, vying for power and trying to take over what Alexander the Great left. They're fighting each other. And uh, eventually it comes down to, if I, if I remember right, General Ptolemy and, uh, and Seleucid, I, I think. Uh, and they're fighting back and forth. And as they do, uh, they're fighting uh, from Egypt all the way up and around to back to Greece. And as they do, they trample over Israel again and again until I think General Ptolemy, I think he eventually becomes the champion and ruler of uh, the empire that was left behind after Alexander the Great died. But that, was, that wasn't that was going to happen for hundreds of years. And Daniel, before these empires even rose, before they even happened, predicted small battles interactions between rulers and leaders that made it seem just unreal. But because, because it involved Israel, it was pertinent to what they were going to see happen in their country um, up and until the coming of the Roman Empire. So that's kind of a, a quick introduction to the last half of the book of Daniel. The first half is a buildup of God giving favor to Daniel and then ultimately him being thrown in the lion's den and him being rescued from it by God. 
And uh, that was just God protecting this great prophet from uh, the ministry being ruined that he was about to release. Eventually, uh, as you're about to see, it will lead up. His prophecies will lead up uh, right up and until uh, the very second coming of Christ. And uh, they will work and join together beautifully and perfectly with another line, timeline that's in the book of Revelation. So uh, a word you're going to be hearing probably a little of today is the word horn. And um, that's because it is the imagery and the metaphor that that God uses, that he used with Daniel to show him uh, the kingdoms, the influencers, and and what the end was going to look like, that build up to the end, which I think we're very close to. And uh, so, yeah, that's sort of uh, my introduction to this timeline, which is a timeline found in the world, okay? So that's what we're going to be studying, Daniel's prophecy of, uh, of a timeline found in the world. That's what we'll be studying uh, that, and then flipping ahead to Revelation and continuing in that, okay? Okay, the first thing I want to get into is found in Revelation uh, chapter 17. I know we just are, you know, I quickly mentioned Daniel, but I'd like you to shift just for a minute to the book of Revelation. Then of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So this is the start. These, this chapter 17 in these two verses, this is the start of the end. It's like Winston Churchill's famous quote. He said, this is not the end. This is merely the beginning of the end. Well, this, these verses found in, first two verses found in chapter 17 of Revelation are the beginning of the end. And um, the reality is the world, the kings of the earth, the peoples of the earth, were, the, were, were made drunk with thoughts, ideas, and sin that they considered okay. They considered they had the same ideology, the same system that was going to cause people all over the world to begin to look at, at life the same and that is happening it's in a system we call secularism that discounts any belief in god any belief in in the the the, the miracle working power of god and even more importantly than that it discounts any belief in the holiness of god and in the idea that he is real and true people just throw that away it's what the Bible in another place calls the great falling away. But that, that's the church, which is another timeline. So this is a timeline that is speaking of a coming together of the world in, in, in one mind. And I believe we have seen that. We are seeing what's called globalism and secularism um, make... Uh, attempt to shame any world leader that thinks outside of his rigid ideas concerning life and and God, and uh, that's it's almost like every leader is every leader in the world is drinking from the same cup. In this picture of them getting drunk by the same uh, in, in the same ideas, fornicating together, believing that sin was meaningless and 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 God was untrue. There's no reality to it. Became a shared thought. That's what the world initially becomes drunk with, and I believe we are in that day. The idea that the world becomes drunk with uh, a, a disbelief in God and an acceptance of, of anything other than that is now. We are there 
in the build-up to what is about to become this beast that comes onto the scene. And it's first described in, da in Daniel as being vicious and destructive and powerfully strong, made of iron. So it, it was something merciless uh, that became weak over time initially. Okay, and um, that's easily described uh, historically, even in the book of Daniel, though it doesn't mention the name, the Roman Empire. In the list of, of empires that are uh, prophesied about, it falls in line with being the uh, empire that comes just before Christ is born here on this earth. So, um, we're going to see that exact same beast transition out of Daniel and into the book of Revelation. So let's, um, let's check that scripture out first in the book of Daniel. Okay, we're going to look at the introduction of this beast with these horns. It's in Daniel chapter 7, verses, verse 7. And before that, there's prophecy in the same chapter leading up to this of a few other beasts that represented kingdoms that were going to come up and until the Roman Empire. And uh, then it switches from that into verse 7. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring and breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. So this, this is the first uh, mention of that uh, similarity between um, the beast in in the book of Daniel and the exact same beast again in the book of Revelation. Okay, let's con continue in verse 8. I was considering the horns, and then there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out, pulled out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. And then it goes on to talk in the next um, uh, three verses, three or four verses, about how the Lord arrives on the scene and uh, destroys this uh, horn, this beast and um, judges it and throws it into uh, into hell and so that's that's a, it's a pretty awesome scene uh, but it leads to some questions but before we go any further I want to uh, break for a moment and go into verses 19 to 21 where Daniel revisits, same, same chapter, he revisits the whole idea of these horns, okay? Then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured broken pieces and trampled the residue with its feet. And the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth, and which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days. So this is almost a retelling of what, um, what we just read uh, earlier in the chapter. Until the Ancient of Days came, and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. And now we're going to follow that same picture of that beast till when it's first mentioned in the book of Revelation. It's in chapter Revelation chapter 17 verse 7. But the angel said to me, why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman 
Remember, we just saw we uh, started earlier with the the idea of uh, the 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 woman people becoming drunk, uh, the great harlot that made people drunk uh, with uh, with wine, and how it was the ideas that are common becoming common among the rulers of the earth today. This woman, that harlot, was sitting on a beast. The first picture of that beast comes in verse 7. Listen to it. I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. Okay? The, now, and, and here's the most telling verse. The beast that you saw was and is not, and then will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. So it was, it is not, and will ascend out of hell. This beast was a uh, carryover of uh, that beast back in Daniel chapter 7 that we just read about a few minutes ago. Uh, this is a, a carryover of that same empire. And it says in verse 8, the beast that you saw was and is not and will come. It was because at the time when this beast rises up, it will have been an empire that existed in the past that comes back for a final hour. And somehow that empire is going to um, geographically, anyway, because it, it talks later on of, of uh, seven mountains on which the woman sits, but it's a geographic image of the, the Roman Empire. This beast came back to rule an empire that, uh, you know, geographically looked the same as the Roman Empire had. It was, it is to come, and then in the final hour, it does come for an hour so it's got it's got one hour of power uh, in its existence in its final existence and um it, it it's the exact same beast described in um daniel it, it omits a few details it adds a few details and then it had seven heads this beast. It never mentioned that in the book of Daniel. It just called it exceedingly horrible to look at, to see. And uh, and also in the book of Daniel, it adds that on the head, and here's a very key thing, on the head of this beast that has 10 horns, one horn pushes up through, a new horn grows, and when it does, it pulls out three horns. So that gives us an image of uh, that Antichrist man coming up as a leader in the old Roman Empire, which is the European Union, covering the span of the old Roman Empire, or potentially a leader within that empire, within that union, is going to rise up to dominate and take over uh, or at least pull together uh, three nations as one. That's a major sign for us to see uh, that would be like somebody would allow or either either allow or through the force of war overtake two other countries while ruling one. It brings those countries together under its rule, possibly somehow dominating the European Union in doing that. The reason I, I think this is really pertinent to today, something is going to happen to potentially uh, give one, one man, one charismatic leader, the ability to overthrow two nations and keep and somehow hold that union together. And that union is under threat, even today. Even today. Not that this is going to be the moment that all of this happens, but it could be. We don't know when that moment is going to come. It will ascend out of the bottomless pit at, for an hour to rule again. You know, will it do that now?
Will that leader that's supposed to overthrow some members in order to potentially keep this union together and be able to give it its power to to rise up against uh, Israel, and that's going to be our next study, uh, how it rises up against Israel. And the timeline of Israel is extremely close. It's it's almost like um, it's a timeline that doesn't take place over a long period of time, but a very short period of time, a lot of very dramatic and horrible things uh, happen to Israel in their timeline from this man, this man that rises up, this this horn on this head, this rebirth of an old Roman Empire uh, gives strength to this uh, wicked and evil and cunning and deceitful leader. It gives him strength to move against Israel over a very short time. Uh, time frame. So that's where, yeah, that's kind of where I'm going to leave it today. I am not telling you that there isn't all kinds more to find in these um, chapters. There is. And there's also more of a story that unfolds um, between these 10 horns and and uh, the whore that sat on top of them. Uh, it, it basically says that woman is devoured and destroyed by these uh, 10 horns because uh, God permitted such, you know, as he was going to allow, you know, the end to come this way. So, there's all kinds of more. There's all kinds of bunny trails you can go on, but the trouble is it's really hard then to, to constantly return to that main timeline and imagery uh, that God gave us concerning the end. So that's kind of the worldly timeline, uh, which is, I guess, focused on the Union, the, the European Union. Next, we're going to have a look at the timeline of Israel, uh, which which has a very short timeline of predict, predicting the return of the Lord, but uh, it intermingles with the worldly timeline, the timeline of the world, um, only after this leader, that horn, uh, breaks uh, away and runs after Israel to attempt to destroy it. And so we're going to look at uh, those timelines intermingling uh, next week. Okay, so I hope you enjoy this, you guys. And uh, it's not an easy thing to go through and to study. And there's not all kinds of information. You have to learn to read between the lines when you're studying this, you know. Uh, but that's what I think we successfully did by, you know, not trying to take on too much all at once from every different chapter, but just kind of sticking to this one imagery. Um, and then next week we're going to deal with the crossover between the timeline of the world and the timeline of Israel. God bless you. Have a great uh, week, and we'll see you next week. Okay, bye. Bye.